بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for the opportunity to gather once again after our break, after our hiatus for around uh, two and a half months. Uh, we're now coming back and resuming uh, the lectures of the seerah. And alhamdulillah, we have covered, I think, around 35 lectures we have done uh, in which the Makki period uh, has been completely covered. And we began talking about the Madani period and we began talking about the major changes that occurred in the first few months of the uh, Madani phase. And the most important of these uh, was a new emphasis of the political freedom of the Muslims. For the first time, the Muslims have political freedom. For the first time, there is an independent state. Uh, for the first time, the Muslims can act as a political body. Whereas in Mecca, they were a persecuted minority. In Medina, now they have a uh, the beginnings, if you like, of a republic. I mean, these terms are, of course, not representative. Whether you call it republic, whether you call it a, uh, a, a political entity is really the best uh, type of description. And uh, as I had already mentioned uh, in the last few lessons that we did, there were two threats facing them. One of them internal and the other external. And each one of these threats we will discuss in the next few weeks. As for the internal threats, Medina was not yet unified under the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, there would always be a group of people who were not happy with the changes. And these are, of course, who are they? The munafiqun, the hypocrites, right? The hypocrites did not want status quo to change. They wanted the old ways. And the Prophet Sallallahu had to deal with them until the very end of his life Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course internally as well we said that there was the uh, other tribes that were not Arab nor were they Muslim. Uh, primarily these were the Yahud tribes and of course in the next four or five years the Prophet will have to deal with them as well. This will be another tangent or another important uh, portion of the seerah. These are the internal difficulties. The external difficulties of course primarily right now it is only Mecca. Right now it is only Mecca. But slowly in the next few years the entire Arabian Peninsula will become involved. So, we need to understand that the animosity at this stage is unique. Mecca and Medina, the Quraysh and the Muslims. Slowly but surely, for the first time in human history, never before has this ever happened, the entire Arabian Peninsula will become polarized between two camps. And this polarization is the precursor to the unification. Okay, all of this is going to be discussed inshallah in the next few, uh, actually towards the very end when we get there. The unification of Arabia, which never happened in the history of humanity, it happened for the first time under our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So how did all that happen? Of course, primarily through these military expeditions. And that is why the history of the Madani Sira is almost 80 to 90% a history of military battles. And this is the reality that we have to deal with, that we would like to know so much more information. But again, the chroniclers only recorded that which was the most important from their perspective. And from their perspective, the Madani phases, probably 80% of it is simply one battle after another. And uh, we will try our best to try to extrapolate the rest of the incidents as they occur. To summarize what we had discussed in the last lesson, because we need to understand that before we begin the Battle of Badr. Uh, there were some minor skirmishes. Two or three are extremely important to understand before we get to Badr. Uh, the first of them is the Sariyatul Nakhla. Who can remind me what was the Sariyatul Nakhla? Who can remind me? Sariyatul Nakhla. This was the very last episode that we did, the very last halaqa about the seerah. One of the was killed when Something happened. I like this. <laughs> Something happened sometime. <laughs> Some Sahaba were sent to find out information outside of Mecca. What happened? You're getting confused. They were not lost. Two of them became lost, but the rest of them got to Mecca. Yes. And then what happened outside of Mecca? So they found an unexpected caravan. 
right? And they raided the caravan and they killed one person in the caravan. They killed one person and they raided the caravan, small mini caravan, probably eight, nine camels. And so complete surprise expedition. The caravan was not armed. They, 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 they gathered the, 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 the expedition, the, the war booty, and they brought it back to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I didn't tell you to fight. I didn't tell you to kill the people. And why was this problematic? Well, it was problematic because it occurred in the sacred months, right? It occurred on the very last day of the sacred months. The very last day, yes, and, and, and then Allah revealed, yes, anuna ka'ni shahla harami qitalin fi. So this is the sariyatun uh, nakhla. Uh, the other incident that we need to remind ourselves of is the ghazwatul uh, ushayra. The ghazwatul ushayra. And again, this we already discussed this before. The ghazwatul ushayra is the part one of the Battle of Badr. How so? The Prophet ﷺ knew that the caravan of Abu Sufyan is going northwards, towards Syria. So the Ghazwatul Ushayra was the intended caravan on the way up. And the Battle of Badr was the same caravan on the way down. Okay? So the Ghazwatul Ushayra set up Ghazwatul Badr. Ghazwatul Ushayra is phase one, but it didn't happen. Because by the time the Prophet got there, Abu Sufyan had heard the news, and he fled quickly, took another route. And so Ghazwatul Ushayra, the Prophet never actually met the caravan. Other minor things happened, and he formed some alliances and tribal agreements. And so there was a success, but there was no military conflict in Ghazwatul Ushayra. Uh, and so what happened because of Ghazwatul Ushayra, Abu Sufyan was on high alert. These days we can say code red now, right? High alert. Why is he on high alert? Because he already knows that the Prophet is interested in his caravan. And the concept of targeting caravans, uh, this is something that goes back even before this. And one of the interesting incidents that I didn't mention before, because we don't have a particular time when it occurred. We have a rough idea it occurred the first year of the, after the Hijrah. When exactly, we don't know. Shows us that the targeting of the caravan was something that even the Ansar were thinking about. Not just the Muhajirun. Even the Ansar were ready to start targeting the caravan. What is this incident? It is narrated in Sahih Bukhari that uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And who is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? He is the leader of the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is the most uh, vibrant, dynamic leader. The up and coming leader of the Ansar. That Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was a close friend with Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the owner of Bilal, the, this famous Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He was a close friend of Umayyah ibn Khalaf in the days of Jahiliyyah. And the two were business partners. So whenever Umayyah would go north, he would stop over in Medina and stay at the house of Sa'ad. And whenever Sa'ad would go to Mecca, he would stay at the house of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So they had a good friendship from the days of Jahiliyyah. One time in the first year after the Hijrah, we don't know exactly when, Sa'ad went down to Mecca, perhaps for business trips, perhaps for some other uh, reason. And it was the custom of the time that they would always do tawaf. They would always do tawaf. So Sa'ad asks Umayyah, come, F uh, tell me when should I go do tawaf? That is going to be a good time. So Umayyah says, go when uh, nobody is going to be witnessing. So clearly there might be some tension. Why? Because Sa'ad is now helping the Muslims. Sa'ad is now, uh, he is now a Muslim. But from the incident, it appears that his Islam was not known either to Umayyah and to the people of Mecca. But even if his Islam is not known, what is known for sure? He is helping the Prophet ﷺ. He is a supporter. He is uh, embracing, he has embraced the Muslims and he is now defending the Muslims. So he asks Umayyah, when can I go to Tawaf so that there won't be any, any tension, any hostilities? So Umayyah says, let's go right in the heat of the sun when everybody will be asleep. So they go at noontime, at Zahira they call it, which is when everybody takes a nap. And lo and behold, Allah Azza wa Jal wills that they meet the very worst enemy and that is Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is coming back home and he sees these two figures and he asks Umayyah, who is your friend? Who is your friend? He figures something is fishy because nobody does tawaf when everybody is going to sleep in this hot sun. And so uh, Sa'ad says, this is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, basically from Yathrib. And so uh, Abu Jahl gets angry and he says, how is it possible that you are performing tawaf around the house in safety after you have given protection to these renegades, he uses the Arabic word subat. And subat, 
يعني صبا was what they call the Muslims that they had become Sabians they had left their religion right and it's a, it's a term of heretic or renegade these zindiq these people that have left the religion of their forefathers how can you give protection to these suba and claim that you will help them and now you have the audacity to come to Mecca show your face and do tawaf in such safety wallahi were it not for the fact that you are a guest of Umayyah, Abu Safwan, he called him Umayyah, you would not return to your house in one piece. This is an open threat, and this is a threat that contradicts everything of their religion and of Islam. As you know, Mecca was haram by the time, from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Man dakhalahu kana amina. No one has the right to stop anybody from coming to Mecca. And Ibn Abbas narrates that in the days of Jahiliyyah, one of us would see a person who had killed his own father doing tawaf and we would not touch a hair on his head. They understood that Mecca is sacred land. But when it came to Islam, the double standards began for the first time. And we're getting this hint now. How dare you come to Mecca after what you have done? What has he done? He has, it doesn't say he has embraced Islam. And therefore it appears Abu Jahl did not even know that Sa'ad is a Muslim. Rather he is saying, you're helping the Muslims. And that is enough of a crime that you shouldn't even come to Mecca. When Sa'ad heard this, he became very angry. He raised his voice so that the people of Mecca could hear. And he said, Wallahi, if you are going to threaten me, and you're going to deprive me of Mecca, of Tawaf, I will deprive you of something that is more painful to you than this. And that is your trade routes to Syria. He said this in front of the Kaaba so that everybody in Mecca could hear. You're going to threaten me, now you're going to see what's going to happen. And so the concept of targeting the uh, the caravans of the Quraysh wasn't just something that the Muhajirun, uh, the Prophet told them to do. Of course, up until this time, no Ansari has participated. But Sa'ad is feeling the pressure. And Sa'ad says, khalas, tit for tat. You're going to threaten me, now you will see as well what we are going to do. And that is exactly what he did. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, that's exactly what he did. That he then began to target in the Battle of Badr, as we're going to study, the caravans of the Quraysh. Uh, the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Badr, by the way, firstly, what is Badr and why is it called Badr? Let's get to the, the, the introductory stuff before we jump in. Uh, Badr is an area or a location that is named after a well, so it's the well of Badr, that is named after the person who dug the well. So Badr is the name of a human. And many centuries ago, he dug up a well. And so it was called the well of Badr. And after he dug up the well of Badr, the whole plain became known called the plains of Badr. The whole area became known as the plains of Badr. And this person, his name was Badr ibn Yakhlud, and he was from the tribe of the Banu Dhamra. And the land of Badr, or the area of Badr, it is around 160 miles southwest of Medina, uh, and 250 miles north of Mecca. So it is in between Mecca and Medina. Inshallah, next class, we'll be using some of the charts and diagrams that our very own Dr. Bashar has very meticulously done. Inshallah, next class, we'll be showing some of those. Uh, for now, all you need to know is that Badr is in between Mecca, Mecca and Medina, and it is closer to Medina than it is to Mecca. In our times, uh, if you go by car, you can easily get to Badr in an hour and 10, 15 minutes. An hour and 15, an hour and 10, uh, you will get to Badr by car. In those days, of course, it, take, it took uh, around three days uh, on, on regular uh, journey. Um, by the way, it's also interesting to know this is a symbolic uh, uh, coincidence, and of course, there is no such thing as a coincidence. Allah's Qadr is all there. That Literally a few weeks before, but less than a month before Badr, a very interesting thing happened that we talked about in our last lesson, and that is the change of the Qibla. It's a very significant correlation. Badr and the change of the Qibla. The change of the Qibla literally occurs, literally, probably three weeks before Badr. And this is just too close to ignore. The, the time frame is too close to ignore. And there is no doubt that there is a huge symbolic change taking place. That the qibla of the Muslims will now be facing Mecca, and then the greatest victory that early Islam ever saw shall be also given to them. In other words, it's as if it's being said, how can you face Mecca and yet not have Mecca in your possession? How can you face the Kaaba and yet the Kaaba be polluted by idolatry? And so Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them with that great victory right after the changing of the uh, Qibla. It's as if there is 
an, a sign or an indication that now that the Qibla has changed and you've won over Badr, slowly but surely, eventually Mecca as well will be yours. You're not only facing it spiritually, you will physically also obtain uh, the city of Mecca and that is of course exactly what happened. Now, now we get to the uh, incident of uh, basically building up the, 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 the incidents leading up to the Ghazwat al-Badr, the Battle of Badr. Uh, this is called the Battle of Badr, the Great Battle of Badr. Ghazwat al-Badr in al-Kubra. Why? Because in our last lesson we mentioned another incident called Ghazwat al-Badr in al-Sughra. And this Ghazwat al-Badr in al-Sughra, the reason it's called Badr is because it took place very close to Badr, the Sughra one, not the Kubra. But it had nothing to do with the Quraysh. The people who were attacked were local tribesmen. So this is called Badr, uh, Badr al-Sughra. It has nothing to do with the tribe of Quraysh. It has nothing to do with the caravan of Abu Sufyan. What was the Ghazwa that was on the caravan of Abu Sufyan? Who can remind me? What was the Ghazwa? Ushayra. Ghazwa al Ushayra. And when did it take place? Who can remind me? This is, should be in your notes for those who are taking notes. Ghazwa al Ushayra, when did it take place? You don't have your notes with you. You have to close and open another file. <laughs> I like that honesty. Yes, it's somewhere else. It's somewhere in my iPad. It's Jumadul Jumadul Awal of the second year of the Hijrah. Jumadul Awal of the second year of the Hijrah. The Prophet went to uh, the, the land or the area of Ushira. He didn't go to Badr, by the way. The, on the way up, he didn't go. When the sorry, when the caravan was going up, he did not go to Badr, he went to another location. And he camped there for a few days, this is Jamadul uh, Ula, uh, and he stayed there until the very first few days of Jamadul Thani, Jamadul Akhirah, and then he returned back to uh, Medina. Now, when the time came, rough time came, that they expected the caravan back, and this is in, in now the month of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ began sending multiple spies to see where has the caravan reached. And we have at least two or three a hadith that mention different spies. So this means basically that over the course of every few days he's spent sending out another few uh, people. Uh, for example, in Sahih Muslim, Anas al Malik says that uh, when uh, the time came for the caravan's return, the Prophet ﷺ sent a spy to inform him about the advent of the caravan. And when the spy returned, when the Sahabi returned, the Prophet ﷺ made sure that nobody was sitting in the room except for Anas. And Anas was excused because at this time he's probably seven years old. Except for Anas, he was excused because he is a, uh, a child and because he's the personal servant. And the uh, Sahabi informed him about the whereabouts of the caravan. In another hadith in Ibn Ishaq, it is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, sent Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Sa'id ibn Zayd. So he sent two of the famous Sahaba uh, to monitor their activities and they waited for the caravan and followed it for a while until the caravan passed them by and then they galloped back quickly to uh, Medina. And they reported that the, that to the Prophet ﷺ that it was under the command of Abu Sufyan that it had all, almost a thousand camels in its uh, entourage. A thousand camels is unbelievable wealth. A thousand camels is something that uh, it is said, uh, early history books say, that the Quraysh had never had such a large caravan in recent history. This was the largest caravan in recent history. Why this is the case, we don't know. But perhaps this is due to economic factors prior to this, that they were basically, uh, they acquired the Muslims' wealth. As you know, they confiscated Muslim property and land. Perhaps other things happened that the books of, of Tariq and history History don't mention, but this was the largest caravan in recent history, in recorded history for the Quraysh. And some modern historians uh, and economists have calculated that the net worth of the caravan would be around 50,000 dinars, 50,000 gold coins. 50,000 gold coins is basically a few million in our times. I calculated myself, but then the problem comes, how much is a dinar? A dinar goes from anywhere from $150 to $600, $700. Depends on the historic value of the dinar as well. Early Umayyad dinars, they go for around $800, $900. Some of them, uh, if you get a really rare, rare one from Al Walid ibn, ibn, ibn Abdul Malik, uh, you actually go for $900,000. So if you do $1,000 per dinar, multiply that by 50,000, 50, you're talking about uh, 30, 40 million, 50 million here. But other dinars in our times go for like two, three hundred dollars So even if you do $100, even if you do $100, that's basically, uh, how much is that? 50,000 times 100 is 5 million, 
right? Five million, for roughly, from our uh, from our uh, currency, right? Five million dollars for the early nascent Muslim community that had nothing. You're talking about changing the entire treasury, really, of the early Muslims, right? So we can understand why the Prophet ﷺ was so eager. Now, in our last lesson, we had already talked about how non-Muslim Orientalists have skewed and have uh, attacked the Prophet ﷺ for saying he's a highway robber. And this is ridiculous because after what the Quraysh have done, this is the least that is to be expected. He's only targeting the Quraysh, he's not targeting anybody else. And frankly, most of that wealth was directly confiscated from the Muslims anyway. That's probably one of the main reasons why the caravan has so much money. Also, Ibn Ishaq mentions that there was hardly any household in Mecca except that they had an investment in that caravan. And this makes it very personal. There's hardly any household in that uh, in the Qabila of Quraysh except that they had a camel or at least something on a camel that they had sent. And again, I don't need to remind you, this was their main source of income. Back in those days, they didn't have salaries and paychecks. You literally got money in bulk, once a year, twice a year. This was their main money. Everybody who had any money would purchase goods and then invest in this caravan. Send it over to Syria, purchase other goods, send it back to Yemen. This is how the people of Mecca obtained their wealth. They are not farmers, they are not cultivationists, they are people who are trading rihlat al shita'i wa sayf. This is their backbone and livelihood. And the Prophet knows full well that if he were to acquire this caravan, what's going to happen? Number one, he will bring the Meccan economy to a screeching halt, completely gone. Every single household and qabila has invested. And number two, he will bring all of that fortune to the Muslim economy. And of course, that is exactly why he was so uh, eager to obtain this wealth to help the Islamic cause. So, Talha bin Ubaidullah Sa'id bin Zaid, they rushed back to the Prophet ﷺ and they informed him that uh, Abu Sufyan is now coming with a thousand camels and that he will be at such and such a place. And so the Prophet ﷺ immediately gathered together the Sahaba and said, now here's a little bit of contradiction, what exactly happened. According to one report in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ did not announce where he's going. And he said, we have a mission to undertake, so whoever has his animal ready should come with me. And some of the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, my animal isn't ready, it's in another place of Medina, let me go get it ready. And the Prophet said, no, only those whose animals are right here and now, we're leaving right now. So that's the version of Sahih Muslim. In a version of Ibn Ishaq, the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba that, هَذَا عِيرُ Quraysh. This is the caravan of the Quraysh. قَدْ أَدْبَرَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ It's coming back to you. And it has in it the money of the Quraysh. So let us go out to meet it, perhaps Allah will give it to you. How do we reconcile? Uh, Allah Alam is very simple to do that. It seems, and Allah knows best, that when he stood in the masjid, he did not announce who or where or what. Because in the masjid there could be munafiqun. There could be hypocrites. There could be uh, spies. There could be uh, still... Mecca, uh, sorry, Medina still has idol worshippers. Medina at this stage still has idol worshippers, as we'll understand, as we'll talk about. One of the main, uh, one of the main turning points of Badr is that after Badr, all of the idol worshippers basically converted to Islam, i.e., munafiqun. That's exactly what happened, right? After Badr, when, uh, um, shirk could not exist in. Medina. So up until Badr, there are still idol worshippers. There are hypocrites. There are other groups there. So the Prophet ﷺ did not make any public announcement. Rather, he said, we have a mission. Whoever wants to go, let's go. But there's one condition. You need to be ready right here and now. Literally, let's leave right now. And that is the ultimate surprise tactic. Not even the Sahaba knew where they're going. Then when the army leaves Mecca, and the Prophet can see that it's now contained who he's with, then he announces to them, this is the caravan of the Quraysh, it's coming back, let us go and attack it, perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you. And so, Allahu Alam, uh, and by the way, this is not what most of the books of Sirah mention. Most of the books of Sirah ignore the report of, of uh, Sahih Muslim, but the report of Sahih Muslim is very explicit, and that is the Prophet did not mention where he's going. Whereas the one in Ibn Ishaq says he's mentioning where he's going. So, Allahu Alam, the way you put this together, which actually makes a lot of sense, he didn't mention in the beginning until finally they left the city and then he uh, mentioned. And this shows us again and again and again. 
It shows us the meticulous planning of the Prophet ﷺ. We have seen this in every major incident. We've seen this in the Hijrah. We're going to continue to see this. We've seen this in the Bay'atul Aqaba. When he, when he did the Bay'atul Aqaba, he stationed Ali in one place. He stationed Hamza in another. He has all of this meticulous care taken place. Even though he's Rasulullah ﷺ, and he, he could put his trust in Allah without doing anything. But that's against the Sunnah. You do everything you can, and then you put your trust in Allah. You tie your camel, and then you tawakkal ala Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't even tell the Sahaba until they are outside of the city. He uses the utmost surprise and caution. As Anas said, he caused everybody to exit the room when the first spy came back, so that only he could hear the news. Nobody knew where they're going until finally, when it, the caravan is right upon them, instantaneously he says, whoever's ready, let's go. He didn't even give them preparation. Why? Well, because this was easy prey. There were only 40 armed guards to this thousand caravan envoy. That's nothing. Why would the Quraysh do this? this? Is a good question I don't have an answer to. Why would they do this? Because the time is tense. You would have thought that they would have been more uh, thoughtful in this regard. Allahu alam, what is the reason? But the fact of the matter is, there were only 40 uh, armed guards, if you like. There were 40 warriors, right? Guarding this caravan, 40 for a thousand camels. Like, do the math yourself. That's basically one person for, how many? F uh, the f uh, f 20, 20 something camels, right? Do the math yourself. Like, that's nothing. That's nothing. And so the Prophet realized, if we only have, you know, two, three hundred people, which is what happened at Badr, that's all we need. And they don't even have to be armed to the hilt. And so whoever's ready, just go home, get your stuff and let's go. That's exactly what happened. And that is why we understand, Badr was not meant to be a war. Badr was not meant to be a battle. Badr was meant to be confiscation of a thousand camels. Badr was meant to be a quick, easy, when they would have seen three, four hundred men, they would have gone helter-skelter, those who wanted to make a stand would have died there, and then the entire thousand camels are taken by the Muslims. What is needed is speed and urgency. What is needed is that the Quraysh not find out. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal willed other than this for a wisdom that was known to him, and we see it clearly uh, after the, uh, in the aftermath of the battle of Badr. So, this sudden instantaneous message explains why none of the Sahaba really was armed to the hilt. None of the Sahaba had their armor on. That the, the animals that were taken were animals that just happened to be there. That the entire army only had two riding horses. They only had two. And that camels were less than a hundred camels. For a caravan of 300 something people, there were less than a hundred camels. Why? Because it wasn't assumed that there would be, they would be needing fast horses. It, wouldn't, it wasn't assumed that they'd be needing a lot of camels. This was easy prey. This was you're targeting a sitting duck. They just have to go, show them 300 people, and then take the, the, uh, the prize. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal, as, uh, as we will find out, willed something else. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he reaches his first encampment, and they set up tents, uh, they, uh, they set up tents, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi first thing he does, he takes a detailed survey of everyone who is now participating. Notice, he couldn't do this in Medina, because he just wants to leave, he just wants to get out. Right. Once they stop and they encamp, now he goes over every single person. He makes an assessment. Now, what do I have? What do I? What do I need to do? And he notices that there are two people who are too young to participate, and these are Al Bara ibn Azib and Abdullah ibn Umar. The both of them are younger than fourteen. Generally, the Prophet would allow. Uh, these young men who had passed the age of 14. He would allow the 14 was the cutoff point. And uh, of course, I mean, for those times and ages, yani 14 was basically what we would consider to be 18. Of course, 14 year olds in our times, we don't even want to leave them alone in the house. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, they'd be too scared to stay alone in the house. In those days, we had 13 years old, Al Bara and Abdullah ibn Umar, they wanted to participate and they were eager to participate. And subhanAllah, every single major battle, we see the same tension. That 13 years old, 11 years old, sometimes they want to participate. And the Prophet ﷺ tells them, no, you cannot do that. We'll see the same thing in Uhud, we'll see the same thing later on as well. That in their eagerness, they want it to be men. right? And I always say that, wallahi, we have dumbed down our own youth. 
that if we were to treat them like adults, that young men would become adults faster. But because we have this false age of adolescence, where biologically they are men or women, but intellectually we treat them like kids, then we're going to get these problems, right? And I firmly believe this, that Allah Azza wa Jal has created, uh, has made the age of puberty to be the age of intelligence. That's the shari- sign of the sharia. And therefore, if society were to treat these youngsters the way they deserve with intellectual integrity, honesty, with respect, then these youngsters would grow up faster. And we find this again, uh, this isn't just Islamic by the way. Yeah, any 100 years ago, 500 years ago, in every society, when you were 14, 15, you were an adult. It's not just in Islamic societies, right? And this is the reality, the sad reality we have to live with that there is this teenage years that we ask Allah to protect us against the problems of teenage years. Um, tayyib, let's get back to the uh, issue of Badr. So Al-Bara ibn Azib and Abdullah ibn Umar were sent back. Because the distance was short, they were sent back alone. Just the two of them, they can basically uh, go home alone because there is just one one journey, one, one uh, day's journey, the two of them can go back alone. And the final count was basically around 315. Some books mention 313, some books mention 315, some mention 317, basically 310 and an odd number. These were all the volunteers. Around 83 of the Muhajirun, 62 of the Aus, and 170 of the Khazraj. 83 of the Muhajirun, 62 of the Aus, and 170 of the Khazraj. The Khazraj were double the Aus, and that is because... For two reasons. Firstly, the Khazraj were more than the Aus. Secondly, the percentage of Muslims in the Khazraj was more than the percentage of Muslims in the Aus. Who can remind me why? The Khazraj were generally the poorer tribe. And the Aus was generally the richer tribe. And therefore, generally speaking, the poor convert before the rich. And the uh, Khazraj embraced Islam quicker than the Aus embraced Islam. And also they were larger in number. Um... The two horses, I said I already said there were only two horses, they belonged to Zubayr ibn al-Awwam and al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, and they were less than a hundred camels, some books mention 70, some books mention more than this, but less than a hundred camels, so basically uh, every person uh, had to share a camel with three people, right? So every camel, there were three people taking turns riding the camel. You cannot have three people riding the camel at the same time. And so what they decided to do was two would walk and one would ride and then uh, it would just take shifts and turns in this manner. Now we have to point out here, there seems to be some significance to this number, 310 and something. There seems to be some significance because it occurs in multiple places in our religion. Of them is, for example, the famous hadith of how many prophets and how many messengers. We talked about this way back last year or maybe two years ago. right? What is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? And the famous hadith of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Ya Rasulullah, kam rasulin ursilan, kam nabiyin. How many rasul? The Prophet said, 310 and something, jammun ghafir, a large quantity. How many anbiya? 124,000. So, 310 and something, that's here Badr. It is also said that the number of people who were in the army of uh, Jalut, uh, uh, um, uh, Talut and Jalut, the number of people that were fighting on the side of Dawood, on the side of David, against Goliath, were also around 310 and something. Right. And so Allah knows best, but there seems to be some type of significance with this uh, number. So we said that the uh, Sahaba had to share a camel, three people per, per camel. And so the Prophet ﷺ uh, was assigned the camel of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And along with them was the famous Sahabi Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba, you will come across his name from the very famous incident that we'll talk about in the incident of Banu Quraida. Abu Lubaba was that Sahabi who made a mistake, he repented and he tied himself to the masjid. Right? As an act of repentance. He did something that he regretted. We'll talk about that when we get there. And he felt so guilty that he went to the masjid and he tied himself up. 
and he deprived himself of food and water and he said, until Allah forgives me, I will not leave this place. And he was almost about to die when Allah Azza wa Jal basically revealed his repentance in the Quran and they said, khalas, you are forgiven. So he said, no, until the Prophet ﷺ himself comes and allows me to be free, I'm not going to be free. So the Prophet ﷺ himself came and he untied Abu Lubaba from that pillar. Uh, this is Abu Lubaba. We'll talk about Abu Lubaba, that story uh, later on. So Ali and Abu Lubaba and the Prophet ﷺ, they were assigned one camel. Imam Ahmad in his Musnad mentions a very beautiful incident now. Can you imagine if you had been assigned the camel with the Prophet ﷺ? What would you do? Not take, not take what? Your turn on the camel, right? Can you imagine, can you imagine that if you had to share a camel with the Prophet ﷺ, what would you do? He will say, Ya Rasulullah, Tfaddal, you guys, you, know, you, you, you take the camel, we will walk. And so, both Ali and Abu Lubaba insisted that, Ya Rasulullah, we will walk and you take the camel full time basically, right? And subhanAllah, the response of the Prophet ﷺ is so sweet and gentle and profound. It's so full of wisdom that you just... You just like mind boggle. How could this is of course coming from Mishkat al from the well of prophecy? Yani he could have said yes, he could have. And wallahi, if he had said yes, who would have objected? He is Rasulullah. Forget even forget even the religious, he is the leader. When does the leader do exactly what the private does, right? Even forget the religious side. A general in the army, right, the five star general never ever travels the same way as the private. He, this is understood, like you work your way up to the top, and then after that, you're given the red carpet treatment, and everybody accepts it. Added to this is the religious side, that he is Rasulullah s.a.w., Khatam al Sayyidu Waladi Adam, on and on and on. Right? And so, if anybody had like uh, done this, nobody would have objected that the Prophet is riding and the other two are walking. Alternatively, he could have said, no, let's be fair, let's share. He could have done that way as well. Just be blunt and say, no, no, I disagree with this. Let's be fair and let's share. And he could have been strict with that. But he allowed them to share in a manner that was very sweet and very beautiful. He smiled back at them and he said, that the two of you are not any younger than I am. You're not any stronger than me. And I am not, now this is a double negative, in any less in need of the ajr than the two of you. I repeat what he said. The two of you are not any younger or stronger than I am. We're all equal men here. Pause here. By the way, technically that's not true because how old is Ali? Yeah. 20, 21. 20s, late, late, late 20s. Or yeah, mid 20s. Mid 20s by now, right? And the process is now, how old is the process? 55. 54, 55. So, even technically, Ali, we don't know the age of Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba, we don't know his age uh, at this time. But yani, we can say he's a middle-aged man. So, technically, the Prophet is the uh, senior of them, in age as well. But he says, the two of you are not any stronger than I am. Now, that might is, is possibly true in terms of physical strength. Yes. And neither am I in any less need of the rewards from Allah that I will get if I walk. And so when he said this to them, they had no response to this. So how are you going to respond? When he says, I'm doing this for the ajr just like you. We're all three men here. We're all three of roughly equal physical strength, right? And so I need the ajr as well. And so he insisted that they take turns on this one camel. And that was uh, his way of enforcing the fairness, the, the equitable uh, treatment. And of course, I mean, it goes without saying, yani, subhanAllah, can you imagine here the psychological uh, repercussions of the Prophet ﷺ walking? Imagine if you were in that army now, in that caravan now, the heat, the desert sand, the thirst, the, the trouble. Now you see the Prophet ﷺ walking. What are you going to do? But you cannot complain. You cannot complain. By the Prophet ﷺ walking with the army, khalas, that's it. Now you are, there is nothing you can do now, right? And again, this is the wisdom, and this is exactly, I mean, no doubt he is Rasulullah ﷺ, but why was he respected? Well, because he acted like Rasulullah ﷺ as well, right? He could have, as they say, like, you know, pulled his rank, 
Right? He could have. And who would have complained? I mean, honestly, who would have complained? But no. And as the, exactly what Allah says, you are the role model. You are the, uh, the, the one who is gentle, merciful. So he walked along with all of the rest of the army. And there was nothing different from him than from the rest of the, uh, of the Muslims. And subhanAllah, when you have a leader like this, what is going to happen? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, they live the same lifestyles. When Umar goes and conquers Jerusalem, look who is he learning this from, right? Who is Umar learning this from? That when he gets to Jerusalem and his slave is on the camel, What does he tell the slave? Hey, it's not fair, it's your turn. Correct? And he walks into Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem think that the slave is Umar, and Umar is the slave, because what leader in the world would walk leading in his slave while he is walking? Where did Umar learn this from? He has the best teacher, the best master, the best muallim, and that is the Prophet ﷺ. Another interesting point here as well, by the way, before we move on again, this is one of the problems of seerah is that the seerah is composed of many small incidents, right? So we need to draw a larger picture by mentioning disconnected incidents, right? And then we just try to put them together. Another disconnected incident that is a precursor to uh, the Battle of Badr, and we have a lot of benefit uh, from this, very deep benefit, especially for the times and the place and the political climate that we are living in. And that is the lack of participation of two people in the battle of Badr. And that is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, uh, uh, al-Yaman ibn al-Hakam. Uh, these two people, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, the two of them could have participated in Badr. And they wanted to participate. But they were held back because of a promise they had made to the Quraysh. Hudayfa and his father were once captured by the Quraysh. And the Quraysh were almost going to kill them. When finally one of them decided, you know what, let's just make them promise that they're not going to ever fight alongside Muhammad Wasallam. As long as they're not going to fight with us, then khalas, send them back, no big deal. So they didn't really have, Hudayfa is not a a muhajir by the way, Hudayfa is neither, this is a longer story, but Hudayfa and his father, well his father, not Hudayfa, his father, is not from Mecca, nor is he from Medina. He he came to Medina in the days of Jahiliyyah because of a crime he had committed. So he abandoned his tribe and he basically came to Medina. He was adopted by the people of Medina. And then he lived, became a, a Sahabi. He accepted Islam. And then his son Hudayfa accepted Islam. So the two of them are neither Makki nor, nor Madani. Quite in this sense. They're neither Qurayshi or nor are they Aus and Khazraj. So when the Quraysh capture them, they don't have any direct animosity. Like these are people who are caught up, basically. So one of them has sympathy and says, okay, you know what? We're not going to kill you, even though you're Muslim. We're not going to kill you. This is of course before the Battle of Badr, a few months before the Battle of Badr. We're not going to kill you, but you have one condition. And that is, you will never fight us alongside the Prophet ﷺ. Right? You're not going to join the Prophet ﷺ fighting us. And so when the Prophet ﷺ heard, when they returned back to uh, from the Quraysh and the Prophet ﷺ heard this, the Prophet ﷺ basically did not allow them to participate in any of these ghazawat. And this shows us that a Muslim is upon his word and promises. A Muslim is never a traitor. A Muslim is never a traitor. They gave their word. And once they gave their word, even in times of great trial and difficulty, they did not take up arms and fight against the uh, Quraysh. The Battle of Uhud, we'll talk about exactly what happened and we'll ex- uh, clarify some points there. But any type of uh, uh, offensive battle that was taking place, uh, Hudayf and his father did not participate and therefore they remained back in uh, Medina. And of course this shows us in our times especially, treaties have to be respected and honored, obligations and duties, including duties that are understood, such as duties of citizenship, let's say. Right? These are obligations, these are legally binding contracts. And if you are a visa carrier or a citizen or whatnot, there are certain obligations upon you, regardless of what's happening in the world. If you don't like it, then you don't have to be a citizen holder or a visa holder. But you cannot be a citizen and a visa holder and then go against what that entails, right? You understand the, the Islamic rulings here. That it is not allowed from the Sharia perspective to break a promise or your word. It is not allowed to be a traitor. You cannot be two-faced. Swear that you're a citizen and then do something that will uh, go against the oath that you have given. Nobody is forcing you to make that oath. And if you're not going to uphold it, then do not say it. 
And that's what we learn from Hudayfa and his father. That even though one can say, hold on a sec, they were almost going to be killed. But they gave their word in solemn promise. Right? They could have been killed. They could have. But they didn't. They said, okay, you know what? We agree to your condition. We're going to go back to Medina and we're not going to fight against you. And when the Prophet heard this, then he did not accept them to fight and they could not volunteer to fight. And this shows us that a Muslim is upon his conditions and promise. Al Muslimuna ala shurutim. This is a hadith. Al Muslimuna ala shurutim. And the ayah in the Quran, O you who believe, fulfill your covenants. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, awfu bil uqud. And you understand the implications in modernity, and I don't need to go into this tangent, and I've spoken about this very explicitly in talks that are related to uh, those issues. Uh, another incident that occurred that the Prophet is leaving Medina, and they still think that they're going to uh, get to the caravan of Abu Sufyan, that one of the uh, pagans of Medina, his name is not mentioned in uh, the early books of Sirah, one of the pagans of Medina who was known for his bravery and fighting skills, he marched up to the Prophet ﷺ, he is not a Muslim, and he says that I wish to join you in order to get this ghanibah, I wish to join you. The Sahaba were happy to see him, because they're getting a strong man. The Sahaba were happy to see him. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you testify that Allah is your Lord and I am the Messenger? He said, no, I'm still a mushrik, I'm still a pagan. No. So the Prophet ﷺ said, inna la nasta'inu bi mushrik. We do not ask for help from the pagans. So the man stayed where he was, and a few hours later he again caught up with the camp. I guess the thought of all of this money, 1,000 camels and whatnot, come, came to him, and once again he said, that allow me to come with you, because he wants to share. Allow me to come with you. Again the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you testify la ilaha illa He said, no. So he said, inna la nasta'idu mushrik. And then a few hours later again he writes in, and he's gotten the point now, basically, right? So now the Prophet ﷺ asks him, and he says, Yes, ashhadu an la ilaha wa shadu Rasulullah. Now he accepts Islam. And so he was allowed to join the caravan at that point in time, or join the expedition at that point in time. And uh, this hadith has been again used politically in our times, and it was used in Gulf War One, Gulf War Two. It was used during all of these times that, uh, is it allowed to ask for military help from a non-Muslim? Uh, or not, because the Prophet said, We do not ask help from pagans. mushrik. And this is a classical controversy amongst the four madhahib. Uh, some scholars say that you can never ask for any such help. Other scholars say that it is allowed with conditions. And frankly, this is not the time or place to get into this tangent. Uh, but you understand this also has political ramifications in the modern world. It has caused a lot of controversies in many lands. Can you get the help of a non Muslim? Right, this happened as you know very, very recently many times. Can you get the help of a non-Muslim army to help you against an aggressing army? So these types of ahadith were then brought up. And this is not the time or place to discuss both opinions. But there is a spectrum of opinion. There is a gray area. For example, Imam al-Nawawi in his uh, commentaries, Imam al-Nawawi says that this, this hadith shows that the general rule is that you do not ask help from the uh, pagan army, but there are exceptions. And Imam al nawawi says, the Prophet himself sought the help of Abdullah ibn Urayqit, who is Abdullah ibn Urayqit, who is Abdullah ibn Urayqit, the guide of the Prophet in the, in the Hijrah, right? Imam al nawawi says, the Prophet himself sought the help of Abdullah ibn Urayqit at a time of great sensitivity. I mean, subhanAllah, think about it. There's a hundred camels on his head, as you know, dead or alive. And a hundred camels is a mini fortune. This man, whoever gave him in, he would have lived comfortably for the rest of his life. Yet he trusted after Allah Azza wa Jal, he trusted his life with Abdullah ibn Uraqit. And so Imam al-Nawi says, if a person has good opinions of Islam, i.e. they are sympathetic to Islam, and they can be trusted, and the situation calls for it, then one can ask the help uh, of uh, mushriks against uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an enemy. Uh, point being, again, this is one of those issues we see over here in this incident. The Prophet said, We don't ask the help of a mushrik. And yet, he himself, at a time, and there are more than this time as well, where the Prophet got the alliances of the pagans, uh, he got the help of, uh, of others. Uh, for example, when Abu Talib died and Abu Lahab was going to expel him, the Prophet got the help of uh, Mutim ibn Adi. Remember this, right? He got the help of Mutim bin Adi and he took the, it is called a jiwar, 
And in our times, it's basically the visa of Mutab ibn Adi. That Mutab ibn Adi has allowed me to stay in Mecca. If Abu Lahab has kicked me out, then Mutab ibn Adi has allowed me. So the point being, you should know that there is a spectrum of opinion. And uh, frankly, each opinion has some, some uh, strength and evidence to it. And in my humble opinion, it is a case-by-case situation and basis that when such a situation arises, then the scholars of that region and land, let them talk amongst themselves and come to a, a conclusion. And this is an ishtihadi issue anyway. Another interesting point here that, subhanAllah, our religion does not ask us to look into the chests of people. Here is a man, Wallahi, the average person would doubt his Islam. Correct? The time, the place, the circumstances. The whole story. Once he says no, twice he says no, finally he says, you know what, okay, khalas, I'm a Muslim. But what does our religion tell us? Judge people by outward and leave the inner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallahi, we would be so much better if we simply followed this, right? Leave the inner affair. Don't doubt people's intention. The Prophet asked him three times, Are you a Muslim? No. Are you a Muslim? No. And there's a lot of money to be gained if he's a Muslim. So on the third time he goes, You know what, khalas, I'm a Muslim. And nobody questions his Islam. Let it be. And in fact, and I have said this previously before, there is no denying that our religion, the Sharia, gave incentives for people to convert. Monetary sometimes, political at other times. Why? Who remembers what I said? Why is there, like somebody says that, you know, uh, your religion encourages people to convert, even financially there are privileges, right? Why? Why is this the case? I said this very clearly. I didn't say that, but that's a valid point. If the, uh, what I said, if they convert for any reason, because Islam is true, we are confident that they will eventually convert for the right reason. That we're so confident of our faith that you know what, khalas, convert for the money, no big deal. But what's going to happen? Slowly, Islam and Iman will enter the heart. And this is the reality that we see from people to this day and age who convert for secondary reasons. Primarily in our times for marriage and love. Right? A person will convert because their spouse wants them to and, and that person is not a Muslim. So the boy is not a Muslim and then this girl says, you know what, if you're not a Muslim, I can't marry you. So he goes, khalas, khalas, okay, I'll be a Muslim. Yes, you know. I mean, wallah, I have had people come up to me. You know, boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, girl falls in love with boy, the boy's not a Muslim. They come to the masjid. She's not practicing Islam, but she knows one thing. She's not wearing hair. She knows one thing. You know, I can't marry him if he's a non-Muslim. So right then and there, and, I, and he asks me, I, there was a case, he literally asked me, I mean, there's nothing I can do. I have to convert to marry her, right? Like he does not want to convert, you know? And I said, no. Unless you convert, you, you cannot marry this person, right? And so he decided to convert. It's not my job to look into his heart, is it? It's not my job. And eventually, these people, as for this couple, I didn't keep in touch with them, but I have met many uh, couples, that eventually the one who converts becomes even more practicing than, than the Muslim, right? Well, like how many times, and this happens to me so many times that, you know, the, let's say the sister converts and then she starts getting more and more religious until finally the husband comes and says, Sheikh, can you tell my wife to calm that religiosity down? She's kind of, you know, going a little bit too much now, you know what I'm saying? And this is so common now that the woman will convert or the man will convert and then one of them, mashallah, tabarakallah, they will go beyond the other. So, so what if he converted for another reason? We're so sure Islam is true. Yalla, bismillah. Whatever your reason is, eventually you'll be a true Muslim. So we don't question people's uh, motives. Now, this is of course the general rule. There might be some exceptions here and there, but here is one of those questions, uh, one of those times when it was not a uh, question. Uh, so uh, getting back again to the issue of Badr The Prophet Sallallahu looking at the various reports It seems that we can guesstimate That he left Medina on the 12th of Ramadan He left Medina on the 12th of Ramadan In the second year of the uh, Hijrah And he uh, put in charge of Medina Ibn Ummi Maktum Who as you know was the blind Sahabi And this shows us that in our religion And wallahi it is a very big deal for the time that when somebody was physically impaired, they were literally treated as outcasts, right? When somebody was blind or lame or something, they were literally treated as subhuman. And the very fact that the Prophet chose a blind person and put him in charge of Medina, Allah, we can clearly say that our religion was uh, very forward thinking for the time, right? That it did not take these personal uh, um, uh, faults, if you're, well not false is not a good word, but uh, these, um, what's the technical term I'm forgetting? 
Handicaps, that's the term. That it did not take these handicaps as being any problem in the job that you're doing. So what if he's blind? He can take charge of leading the player. He can take charge of the civil affairs of Medina. What has his blindness got to do with, with this? Whereas, wallahi, for other people at the time, to be blind, to be deaf, to be, you, would, you would be treated as a crazy person. Or you would be treated as subhuman, as a child. And the very fact that Ibn Umi Maktoum is being put in charge of the city shows us our religion did not discriminate against uh, people who have physical uh, handicaps. And so, and this is not the only time, by the way. Ibn Umi Maktoum was put in charge of Medina at least a dozen times. Why? Because he was a sensible man. He was a wise man. And his blindness did not come into the way of him being basically in effect the temporary mayor of Medina, right? Being in charge of Medina. That's a very prestigious position. And the wisest person they could find was Ibn Umm Maktoum. Um, in the meantime, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ left uh, Mecca on the 12th of Ramadan. Abu Sufyan is coming back and Abu Sufyan is taking extra precautions to find out what is happening. Is the Prophet ﷺ going to attack or not? Why? Because he's already... Uh, he already found out that the Ghazwatul Ushera just barely missed him by a day. The Ghazwatul Ushera, he literally sk- uh, saved it by the skin of his teeth, as they say. One day, otherwise he would have been caught. right? And so, Qadr Allah, Ghazwatul Ushera was the warning for Abu Sufyan. That was what sent him off his warning bells. That on the way back, Abu Sufyan took extra precautions. So much so, he would send spy parties out to spy on the spies. There's a spy game going on here. Right? He would send delegations out to find out, is anybody spying on us? And it is said that, uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that, uh, some Bedouins mentioned that they saw two men spying on the camp. Of course, these are Talha and Sa'id ibn Zayd. Right? The Bedouins mentioned that there were two men who were spying on you. And so Abu Sufyan said, show me where they camped. So the Bedouins took Abu Sufyan to the camp of these two men. We are assuming they're Talha and Sa'id, who else could they be? And Abu Sufyan examined their camp and examined their markings until finally he came across camel dung. And in his intelligence and desperation, he opened up the camel dung. And what do you think he found? Dates of Medina. (laughs) Exactly right. But not the dates, but the date seeds. Big difference. (laughs) Right? He found the date seeds of Medina. Right? Now, I mean, obviously it's a little bit uh, disgusting, even though technically camel dung is not najis. I have to say that even though I wouldn't touch it, but still it's not najis. But still, well, it shows you these are scouts. These are people who know how to analyze, right? To open up, to crack open a camel dung and to examine what is in this camel dung and then to pick out the seed and say, and he said, these are the dates of, of Yathrib, right? He recognizes the seed from where it is coming. Khalas, everything fits into place now. And so Abu Sufyan panics. Abu Sufyan panics because he realizes we are being monitored. And therefore this panic causes him to go into overdrive mode. And he does two things, both of which Qadr Allah saved him, but Allah's Qadr was also there. It brought about the biggest disaster to the Quraysh, right? In saving himself, he brought about the biggest disaster to the Quraysh, that Allah blessed the Muslims with. So he did two things. The first thing that he did is that he took an unknown route. Immediately, as soon as he found out this is happening, he hired a local guide and he says, get us out of here. Take us from the shore. And he went from a much farther route. He basically bypassed. And inshallah next week we'll show the maps that Dr. Bashar meticulously has drawn or powerpointed or whatever. uh, That he basically bypassed the entire city so that he wasn't even close to where the Prophet ﷺ would have been. And the second thing he did is that he sent for reinforcements. He sent for reinforcements. And how did he send for reinforcements? He sent his fastest rider who had the fastest uh, camel and that is Dhamdham Dhamd, uh, ibn Amr al-Ghifari. Uh, he sent Dhamdham to go to Mecca and to announce to the Quraysh that unless they do something, their caravan will be confiscated. Unless they send reinforcements, your money has now been destroyed. And so, Bamdam immediately uh, proceeded on the fastest camel possible. And uh, really, it was very fast because think about it, that this is probably taking place, probably taking place around the 10th, I mean, two, three days before the process of leaves. Because again, these are the two spies. Soon as the two spies come back, literally as soon as they come back, what does he do? He goes to the masjid, he says, right now, let's go. Somebody says, I want to pack my bags. No, right now, let us go. 
right? Look at the, the quickness. He doesn't want the news to get to Abu Sufyan. So within two, three days, Ramadan must have reached Mecca. Mecca, the same day they make the decision, within three days they come back and they're at Badr. This is super fast speed. And this we'll discuss inshallah. In the next lesson, we have one more thing for today inshallah. And that is events happening in Mecca before Ramadan arrives. One thing happens in Mecca before Ramadan arrives that sets the stage. And that is the dream of Atika binti Abdul Muttalib. Atika, the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, the full sister of Abdullah and Abu Talib. She is the full sister of Abdullah and Abu Talib. And, uh, and therefore she is the full aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa By the way, did Atika accept Islam or not? Uh, Wallahi, it seems to be a difference of opinion. Uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions that the only aunt of the Prophet who ever accepted Islam is, everybody should know, Safiya. That is by unanimous consensus. Ibn Ishaq says the only aunt, Am, Amma of the Prophet to accept Islam is Safiya. Uh, however, Ibn Sa'ad says that Atika also accepted Islam. This one, Atika, that we're going to talk about. And that Atika migrated to Medina after this, and she died in Medina. Truth be told, even Ibn Hajar finds this skeptical because we don't have a single report about anything from Atika after this dream. And had she converted to Islam, we would have heard of stories like we have heard from Safiya. So Allah knows best. Maybe she did. Ibn Sa'ad says that she did, that Safiya and Atika were the two. Whereas Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Ishaq is the earlier and the greater authority. Ibn Ishaq says none of the aunts of the Prophet ﷺ accepted Islam other than uh, Safiya. So keep this in mind and Allah knows best uh, whether she accepted Islam or not. One thing for sure, we never hear of her after this dream. This is the only incident that we hear of her and after this she is basically what happened and when she died and whatnot. We don't have any indication and yeah, anyone who can say had she been a Muslim then this would have been uh, preserved with more care. But in the end indeed Allah knows best. So what dream did Atika see? Atika had a dream three days before Dhamdam's arrival. Three days before Dhamdam arrived in Medina. So they have no clue what's going on. She woke up flustered and agitated. And she called her brother Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. She was close to Abbas. She was the closest to Abbas in age and in uh, bond. So she called her Abbas. And she said that I saw a nightmare. I saw a dream that I'm very concerned. It's, giving, it's making me very uh, scared. Abbas said, what happened? Tell me. So she said that in my dream, I saw that a crier had come to Mecca. That a crier is going to come to Mecca, excuse me, in three days. So she predicted, in three days, a crier will come to Mecca, racing on his camel. So she's seeing the crier, she's seeing the camel, and she, see, and she knows it's going to be in three days. And he first goes to the masjid. And he cries out in the masjid, Ya Ghudar, O you traitors and betrayers, people who have betrayed, O, P, o, o traitors, meet your death in three days from now. So six days from the, when she's saying this, three days and then three days. Go out and meet your death in three days from when I'm announcing this, right? Go out and meet your death. And then she said, the crier was on top of the Kaaba, so first he's next to the Kaaba. Then he's on top of the Kaaba and he says the same thing. Then he's on top of the mountain of Abu Qubais. The mountain of Abu Qubais, you still see it in Mecca. When you go to Mecca, you will find that small mountain that you can see from the Haram. This is the mountain of Abu Qubais. He is on the mountain of Abu Qubais. And the mountain of Abu Qubais was the highest peak in the immediate vicinity. And many times when they wanted to make a very major announcement, uh, they would go to the sometimes Abu Qubais mountain and sometimes to Safa and Marwa, which is closer. Abu Qubais is a little bit farther outward. And so he was standing on the mountain of Abu Qubais and he said the same thing. So he is saying it three times again. What is he saying? Ya Ghudar. Ghudar is the plural of those who are betrayed. Ghadara is to the worst type of, of, of betrayal. The worst type of uh, uh, traitors. Right? Why are they traitors? Because they have betrayed the foundation of what they considered jahiliyyah, of what was most important to them, and that is blood. Blood. Qabila. Tribes. Right? The one thing they value is tribes, tribalism. And what have they done? For the first time in Arab history, they have broken tribes. The Quraysh. And they have not allowed their tribesmen to basically live with them. 
This is one reason they're called traitors. Some can also say, and there's nothing wrong with this, they are traitors to the religion of Ibrahim. And this is also plausible. They are traitors. Ya Khudar, O traitors, meet your death in three days. Go out and meet your death. Then Atika is saying, this crier picks up a large rock from the mountain of Abu Qubais and he topples it from the mountain. And Atika is saying, she sees the rock go down all the way from the mountain until when it gets to the base, it splinters and cracks up. And then it continues rolling until every house in Mecca gets hit by one of the rocks. Right. So the boulder cracks and then every house is hit by one of these stones. Now what is the interpretation? It's pretty obvious. The interpretation is that whatever announcement this man will make will cause the deaths of these traders in three days. They don't realize it, but that's what the announcement will cause. That they're going to die in three days. And the rock hitting every house is the sign that every house will be struck with the calamity. What calamity? The death of multiple people in the household. Not a single household of the Quraysh was spared in the battle of Badr. Every household had debts. Every household was affected. And so the crier is predicting, and, and, and that is the rock coming down, the boulder coming down, that every one of your houses will be uh, affected by this incident that's going to happen. And so uh, Abbas became very uh, worried as well. And he said to uh, Atika, he said to Atika that, Wallahi, this dream is a very dangerous dream. And I am worried if you tell it to people, you will get into trouble. So keep it to yourself. Don't tell anybody about this dream. It seems like a very dangerous dream. And it is said that Atika used to see these regular dreams. And we know that seeing dreams is something that Allah blesses people with. Uh, seeing dreams uh, that can be interpreted. The king at the time of Yusuf saw these dreams, right? The king at the time of Yusuf was not a Muslim, and yet he saw these dreams. Being a Muslim, non-Muslim doesn't mean uh, these dreams can come to non-Muslims as well. And so Atika sees this dream. So Abbas says, don't tell anybody because I'm worried what will happen if people hear about it. Yet, being the man that he was, he could not follow his own advice. He tells Atika to be quiet, but he goes and tells his best friend. And that is Al-Walid ibn Utbah, and he says, Oh Al-Walid, please don't tell anybody else. You see where this is heading, right? And so Al-Walid says, yeah, I'm not going to, I promise, promise I'm not going to tell anybody. And Walid goes and tells his father Utbah. And he tells his father, look, Abbas made me promise. So basically you get the point here. Within a short period of time, the whole city of Mecca is now gossiping about this strange dream. You want to keep a secret? Keep it a secret from yourself and to yourself. That's the only way to keep it, right? You tell two people and that's it, the secret is out. So Abbas was the one who opened up the doors to telling the secret, even though he's the one telling Atika, don't tell anybody. So Abbas still thinks that nobody knows because he has only told Al-Walid. Yet within a few hours, it spreads and gossip and the whole people of, of Mecca are now talking about this strange dream of Atika. However you want to interpret it, there is clearly doom and dread. O oh, traitors, meet your death in three days. That's not a positive dream, right? And a rock comes and smashes into every house. That's not a good dream. So you don't need to be an expert in dream interpretation to know that this dream is against the Quraysh, right? right? So the Quraysh are not too happy at this dream. Abbas doesn't know that they're not too happy. In any case, he goes to sleep. By the time he wakes up, everybody in the city is gossiping. But he still doesn't know. He goes around his business buying and selling, then he decides to, as he usually does, as was the uh, custom of most of the Arabs and Quraysh at the time, to do tawaf after Asr, just go and do tawaf, this was their custom. So he goes and he does, and he's going to do tawaf, when he sees Abu Jahl surrounded by his entourage, his minions. And Abu Jahl says, Ya Abbas, when you're done, come here. Abbas figures what's going on. He doesn't still doesn't get the point that the dream might have reached Abu Jahl. He does tawaf, and then, he comes to where Abu Jahl uh, had called him. And Abu Jahl says to him that, O children of Abdul Muttalib, again the Banu Hashim, since when did you get a female prophetess as well? You understand the sarcasm here. Okay, we get the point you think you have a male prophet. Since when did you get a Nabiya as well? A female prophetess. Abbas says, what do you mean? He's like, it's caught now. What do you mean? And... Uh, 
of course, uh, Abu Jahl is going on and on. He's like, are you, uh, he said, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib, O children of Abdul Muttalib, are you not satisfied? Isn't it enough that you have men who claim to be prophets, but you're not, you're not satisfied with that? You now want women to be predicting the future as well? If it is true that a crier will come after three days, then it will happen, it is true. But if it does not happen, then by Allah we will write a, basically we'll say a sign in those days, and we will place it on the Kaaba, the door of the Kaaba, that the Banu Abdul Muttalib are the most lying of the Arabs known to man. He is angry, Abu Jahl. And he says, if this does not happen, then we are going to publicly shame you. Enough is enough. You already claim to have one prophet. Now you're going to bring forth another prophetess, a female uh, prophet. Al-Abbas, narrating the hadith himself later on, he says, I was caught off guard, and so I denied everything. This is what happens when you're caught in a lie. You just deny. No, no, you're mistaken. Whoever told you, we didn't see, she didn't see any dream. right? He denies everything. But... The news of what Abu Jahl has done to Abbas and humiliated Abbas and humiliated the Banu Abdul Muttalib because again, Abu Jahl belongs to which tribe? Everybody should know now. Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum. Abu Jahl belongs to the Banu Makhzum. So the Abu, uh, Banu Umayyaz, Abu Sufyan, all of them. Uh, Abu Jahl belongs to the Banu Makhzum. So the Banu Makhzum and the Banu Hashim have their rivalries. And the Banu Umayyah, these three had their internal rivalries, right? So the Banu Makhzum has a rivalry. So now this Makhzumite has publicly dissed the Muttalibites, right? And so the Banu Abdul Muttalib are now fuming. Abbas denied everything. Before he even gets back to his house, the women have heard what just took place. MashaAllah, how news spreads. And when Al Abbas comes back, the women began lashing out at him. And they literally say, are you not a man? Where is your manhood? Could you not defend your own women? Now it's not a matter of dreams, or not, it's a matter of tribalism now. right? Forget what Atika saw. Where is your man? Have you no shame? They literally said, don't you have murua? Have you no shame? You were dissed and your sister was dissed and the whole Banu Abdul Muttalib were dissed and you just stand there and take it? Until finally Abbas says, I decided that khalas, the next day I have to go back and publicly rebuke Abu Jahl and defend the Abdul Muttalib, the Banu Abdul Muttalib. Okay? So now it's becoming into a tit for tat. And Al Abbas says, For the rest of the day, all the women of the Banu Abdul Muttalib came and had it out with me. The whole clan came and basically said, You have to do something. Have you no shame? This and that. So now he is now thinking, What can I say tomorrow? And so the next day, he wakes up and the first thing he does, he walks straight to the Kaaba to find Abu Jahl. And he's narrating, this is in the first person, it's narrated in the Mustadak of Al-Hakim, it's in the first person. And uh, Al-Abbas says that, uh, when I came to the masjid, I saw Abu Jahl in the distance. As soon as he saw me, he turned pale, turned his back to me and walked away. Abbas is saying, what is the matter with him? Doesn't he have the courage to face me now? Now he thinks his bravery has got the better of him, right? And I went to go face him when I finally saw what had caused Abu Jahl to go pale. What was that? It's now the third day. It's now the third day. The second day, Abu Jahl rebukes him. Then he wakes up, it is the third day. And the crier has already arrived. Abbas has not heard him yet because he's walking out. Abu Jahl has already heard him. And so Abu Jahl is so embarrassed, he cannot even face Al-Abbas. Right? And the crier is none other than, of course, uh, Dhamdam. And uh, to make the effect even more uh, melodramatic, even more melodramatic, uh, Dhamdam had actually mutilated his own camel. In one, uh, in one uh, narration it is said, he chopped its nose off, a'udhu billah, like some a mutilation. And he smeared the blood over the, the camel. Uh, this would also make the camel panic, by the way, to make it faster even, right? And he tore his clothes up, he put all of this soot and this dust on himself, and he rode the camel backwards. All of this to have a melodramatic effect and to give the impression that he himself had also been attacked, right? And he begins to cry out when he gets to Mecca, that, O Quraysh, your caravan, O Quraysh, your caravan, your property and money with Abu Sufyan, 
it is being attacked by Muhammad and his companions right now. And you will not be able to defend it unless you act immediately. Now everything is a lie by the way, as of yet. Because he is saying it's being attacked. Whereas there was a threat of attack. right? And he is coming as if he has been attacked. Even though nobody has touched him. So there is a... Uh, a desperation There is a uh, uh, An exaggeration going on here That he's trying to make this melodramatic effect That your caravan, your money will be lost Unless you do it now An-Naja, An-Naja Help, help Basically, SOS, SOS And so He came to the masjid He came to the Kaaba And he made the announcement Of course his announcement was Come and fight And Atik was already telling them No, come and meet your debts you're going to meet your debts, right? And this was, of course, the prediction of uh, Atika. And uh, we have come to the end, inshallah, of today's. Uh, next Wednesday, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll start off from the preparations of the Quraysh and uh, also show you some of the maps and diagrams uh, also of the Battle of Badr. If there are any uh, questions, we have, we have uh, five minutes of questions, inshallah, ta'ala. Abu Jahl Amr ibn Hisham. Yes. Abu Jahl was his kunya from the very beginning. Yes, Abu Sufyan sent Dhamdam. Abu Sufyan sent Dhamdam because he, it is said he, that he had the fastest horse. And he was the fastest rider. And it's clear he was because he got there so quickly. Sisters, any questions? Brothers, yes. So this is a question of usul al-fiqh and the question is do does the ruling upon the prophet some differ from the rulings upon the other muslims the response is there is there are some elements of the sharia some aspects of the sharia where what is unique to him is different uh, than what he legislated upon us so there are certain hadith that have been interpreted in this light that that was unique for the Prophet ﷺ, and it was not something that we need to follow. But these are exceptions and not the rules. And generally speaking, when these exceptions exist, he himself points it out. And the most famous, famous example is that of wisal, which is fasting two, three days nonstop, right? Or it is explicit in the Quran where Allah says, Khalisata laka min dunil mu'minin. It's in the Quran. Special for you. Only for you and not for the other believers. So it is true that this is something that exists in Usul al Fiqh, but we don't invoke this principle unless there is an explicit evidence to show this. Otherwise, the general rule is that everything the Prophet did and said and approved, we are also told to follow it. Because he is the, generally, he is our Uswa. He is the Uswa. Now, this does play into Fiqh, for example, drinking while standing. The Prophet. Apparently, there's a hadith, some ikhtilaf, whether it's authentic or not, said don't drink while standing, but he himself drank while standing. This is in Bukhari as well. How do we do this? Some people say khas for him. The majority say, well, this shows it is allowed. You can do it, but it's makruh to drink while standing. Uh, urinating while standing as well. There seem to be uh, things that one hadith says he did it, and another is like he never. So how do you reconcile? Some said it's khas, others said no. Uh, when there's a need, you do it, otherwise you don't. So there, this tension does exist in fiqh. But it should only be evoked when there is no other means of reconciliation. Also the fact that he's doing this publicly for the communal benefit. Right? Allahu Adam, uh, this cannot be used in this case. Allah knows best. Yes. Yes, we did mention this in the last lesson, which was before Ramadan, which I, probably you weren't here when we did that. Um, the justification, one needs to realize a number of things. First and foremost, that that world is very different than our modern world. And the rules and the laws that we are accustomed to, were not rules and laws they are accustomed to. And it is unfair to read in our ethical values into their time and place. It is unfair to assume we have a higher standard uh, than they did, which is what many of our people of our contemporary times think. No, they had a different standard and different uh, uh, style of living. And <clears throat> attacking caravans was something that every group did with another group they didn't have a treaty with. There was no government in Arabia. 
There was no unified government in Arabia. And this was the law of the jungle. That's exactly what Ja'far said to the king, right? When he went to Abyssinia, that the strong devours the weak. And Islam came and brought about a system of government. And Islam came and said, it is haram to do this once the system of Islam is established. Okay? But in that establishment, Islam did have to go on the offensive and defensive. And the attacking of the Quraysh is both a defense and an offense at the same time. The Quraysh are not a neutral tribe. The Quraysh have caused all of the sufferings and damage to the Muslims. The Quraysh have persecuted the Muslims for 13 years. The Quraysh have not allowed the Muslims to live. The Quraysh have expelled the Muslims. The Quraysh have confiscated the property of the Muslims without paying them a penny in return. And that is probably why this was the largest caravan. Right? So this is a state of war going on. And the Quraysh knew it. That's why Abu Sufyan himself is taking precautions. Okay? So there is no treaty that is being broken. There is no understanding that is being contradicted. Rather, the understanding is if you can get it, you're going to get it. Both the Quraysh and the Muslims knew this. Right? So really there is nothing problematic at all. And that is the least that we can expect after all that the Quraysh has done. There is no, even according to modern standards... Even according to modern standards, if you look at what the Quraysh has done to the Muslims, yani this is a state of war. And in a state of war, this isn't collateral damage, no. Yani we don't even need to get into what is happening in modern times and sanctions against countries where hundreds and thousands of children are being killed. Why? Because of the one dictator in person. And this is what is happening now is much worse, much worse under the guise of democracy and, 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 and whatnot. So... Frankly, there's nothing at all surprising at, 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 at what is happening and it is justified even in terms of modern laws. And Allah knows best. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yes, I had mentioned this before and there's a number of theories. The one theory is that Abbas uh, was uh, sympathetic to Islam but not a Muslim. Uh, the other theory is that Abbas was a Muslim and the Prophet ﷺ had instructed him to stay there to inform and that's exactly what he did in the battle of Uhud in the battle of Uhud he was the one who informed the Prophet ﷺ about what was happening okay Tafaddal The question is, what is the wisdom in saying the Qur'an is Arabic? No, no, the wisdom of Allah said in the Qur'an, that the Qur'an says this is an Arabic Qur'an, so that you may think, what is the wisdom of Allah saying that this Qur'an is an Arabic Qur'an, if your studies of Arabic culture, pre-Islamic... Allahu alam, I don't know it's anything to do with Arabic culture, it's rather Allah is speaking to those upon whom the Qur'an came down, and they are the Arabs, and Allah is saying that I have sent this Qur'an in Arabic so that you can understand it. So it's not being given to you in a foreign language like we say it's not in Greek. So Allah is saying inna anzalna Quran al la'allakum ta'qilun, right? That Allah is saying that and again the mukhatabun or the people that are being addressed are the Arabs at this point in time. That the Quran is coming down to the Arabs. At this point in time everybody who's li- listening to the Quran and hearing it is an Arab and who understands Arabic. So Allah now the question is problematic for the non-Arabs. And I've been asked this when we did Surah Yusuf like what do the non-Arabs do? Right, and that's a whole different tangent which you're not asking. You're asking, what is this question? Uh, 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 what is the wisdom here? The wisdom here is Allah is saying, this is in your language, go study and understand it. And Allah challenges them that if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed, then bring something similar to it, right? So Allah is using their own eloquence and their own language and outbeating them, outwitting them in their own game. And Allah is saying, if you're in any doubt, you think you know the language, bring something similar to it. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Final question from the sisters before we... Yes, go ahead. We don't have any details about what exactly is on the caravan, on the camels. We don't have any details. We can only assume from secondary sources. And the assumptions are that the buying and selling that takes place is the middleman type of buying and selling. For example, when a businessman goes to another country, he buys the goods of that country, he comes back to the country he's living in, then he'll sell them to his people. Then he'll purchase the goods that are not available elsewhere and go back there. So we we already mentioned the genius of the great-great-great-grandfather of the Prophet the fourth generation, the fifth generation grandfather of the Prophet was the Rihlat al-Shita'i was Saif. 
that he made Mecca an economic center. He made Mecca an economic lifeline that he goes all the way down to Yemen. And from Yemen, you will get the imports of Africa, Ethiopia, of Habasha, of uh, the Yemeni uh, coast, which is a lot of things in Yemen. And then he brings it up to Mecca. In Mecca, all of the tribes come for Hajj across Arabia. So you buy and sell from every single tribe, different furs, different spices, different goods, everything. And then you go up to Rome, and then you're connected to the entire Roman peninsula, I mean not peninsula, the whole Roman Empire, from east to west, from uh, North Africa, all the way up to uh, what is now basically the borders of Iraq. You're getting all of these goods in Rome. So Mecca becomes an economic capital. It is highly doubtful, this is my guesstimation, that the caravan would have physical goods of the Muhajirun. No. They're coming back from Syria, so they have the goods of the Byzantines. They have their utensils, they have their pots, they have their spices, they have the furs, they have the silks, they have the cloth that is famous in, uh, in uh, the, the Byzantine lands. They're going to come back to Mecca, and then in Mecca, the Arabs are going to come from across Arabia and purchase these goods, because they're not going to go all the way up to Syria. They're going to come in Hajj, they're going to purchase all of these goods, get a lot of money and a lot of other goods, and then go back to Syria. So, Allahu Adam, and also what Ibn Ishaq says, everybody had invested in the caravan, right? So the investment is done basically with a monetary quantity that you have 5,000, 10,000 uh, in the caravan. I don't think there's going to be a physical good that the Muhajir is saying, I want to get my particular, you know, something back. Uh, this does not seem to be the case, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, Allah Azza wa knows best.